Okay, uh, I would like to welcome everyone today to this uh, very important conference. It's going to represent the 75th anniversary, which is happening this Saturday, of the uh, treaty that was uh, established by the United Nations on uh, December the 9th, 1948, to uh, eradicate a genocide by making genocide a crime. And we're going to start out with a, a little short speech from me, and then we'll have a, another little short speech, and then we'll go to the uh, um, regular program, as, we, as we've as seen in the back. Uh, my name is Michael Cunningham, and I'd like to introduce or I give a welcome, not to the people that are participating, but to the people who gave their lives in Belarus, over 3 million people. First, let's talk about the basic right to education. Every child and every student deserves to know the truth about the world's history, no matter how gruesome or unpleasant it may be. The Holocaust was a dark chapter in our co collective lot past. Yes, but it is a chapter that must not be erased or rewritten. Belarusian students, like all other students, deserve to learn about, not just because of its history, but because it's a testament to human reality resistant uh real realist a uh, resistance and the survival in the face of unmanageable cruelty second the desire for truth the youth of today are inquisitive curious and unafraid to question the world around them they desire to learn about the holocaust not merely because it's a historical uh event but because they seek to understand the depths and heights of human nature they yearn to comp comprehend how such horrors could occur and how we as society can prevent them from happening again. Third, the delivery of this knowledge, we live in the age of information where the truth should not be a luxury, but a basic right. It is our responsibility as educators, leaders and citizens to ensure that the truth about the Holocaust is available, accessible and accurately presented to the students of Belarus. This is not a task that we can shy away from. This is a duty we must embrace. In conclusion, the term edgicide would serve as a stark reminder of the importance of education. The truth about Holocaust must not fall to the gen uh, genocide of education. It is a truth that the Belarusian students deserve, desire to learn, and is a truth they, we must commit to delivering. And I believe they are well on their way with a very excellent program. And that's what we're going to be talking about today, about uh, the prosecution. Now we have a, uh, a student of mine, uh, Yosvani. He's going to give a little talk about secondary education. Let me try to share that real quick. <clears throat> oh, my name is Yosvane Trujillo, and I too, as well, uh, I represent an importance of why we should teach, you know, history in secondary schools and high school because it's what gives us the truth. And we need to shape the future with history, understanding the present and shaping the future. History provides context for the present and guidance for the future. It helps students understand the world they live in today by illuminating past events and societal changes. This includes political, political shifts, tech, technological advancements, cultural movements, and economic development. By studying history, students can draw lessons from the past to inform their decisions and actions thus shaping a better future. All right. Developing, uh, it also helps develop critical thinking. History is not just about memorizing dates and events, it's a subject that fosters critical thinking. It encourages students to question, analyze, interpret, and evaluate various sources of information. This not only enhances their understanding of history, but also equips them with essential skills that are applicable in other academic areas and life in general. And it provides awareness. 
Promoting cultural awareness and empathy, history exposes students to diverse cultures, perspectives, and experiences. It fosters a sense of global awareness, appreciation for diversity. Studying the histories of different nations and cultures helps students develop empathy and respect for others, which are fundamental to, fo to fostering harmonious relationships in a mutual cultural society. And it also helps prevent history from repeating itself. The study of genocide, such as the Holocaust, the wrong, the wrong genocide, and the Armenian genocide serves as a stark reminder of the catastrophic consequences of hate, prejudice, and intolerance. It underscores the importance of vigilance against such destruct destructive ideologies. By learning about these horrific events, students are reminded of the importance of promoting peace, justice, and inclus inclusivity. And it promotes human rights awareness. Studying genocides also raises awareness of human rights, helps students understand the importance of protecting these rights and the detrimental effects when they're violated. This can inspire students to become advocates for, for human rights and societal justice in their own communities and globally. In conclusion, teaching history, including genocide studies at secondary schools, is crucial for shaping informed, empathetic, and societal so socially responsible individuals who can contribute positively to society. Now we're gonna hear a real short introduction from uh, another one of my students. She's an intern at the uh, World Affairs Council. It's an email. Email. Okay. Now we got it. I'm sorry. <laughs> okay, ladies and gentlemen, I stand before you today to address a topic of great importance, not only to the people of Belarus, but to humanity as a whole. The subject on hand is current prosecution of Nazi war criminals in Belarus. This process, though it may seem a pursuit of justice decades late, is critical for three fundamental reasons. First, it serves as a testament to the principle of accountability. It is a poignant reminder that no matter the passage of time, individuals who have committed atrocities cannot escape the long arm of justice. It is a powerful message to anyone who thinks that they can hide behind the veil of time to evade their crimes. It echoes the universal truth that no matter how long it takes, justice will always prevail. Second, these prosecutions are a crucial part of the healing process for the victims and their families, as well as the nation as a whole. The trauma inflicted by Nazis during World War II has left indelible scars on the psyche of the Belarusian people. By prosecuting these criminals, we can bring some closure to those who were directly affected and offer them some solace in knowing that those responsible have been held accountable. Third, the process of prosecuting these war criminals provides a valuable opportunity for education and reflection. It provides a chance to revisit the horrors of the Holocaust to reflect on the depths to which humanity can sink, 
sink when guided by hate and prejudice. But more importantly, it serves as a stark warning for future generations about the atrocities that can occur when power goes unchecked, reminding us of the critical need for vigilance, understanding, and peace. In conclusion, the current prosecution of Nazi war criminals in Belarus encapsulates the resilience of human spirit in its pursuit of justice. It offers closure to the victims and their families while standing as opponent symbol of their accountability. It reminds us of our past, educates us in the present, and guides us towards a future where such atrocities are forever averted. Let us remember, let us learn, but most importantly, let us ensure that such horrors are never repeated. Thank you. Okay, well, we should be going to that 845 um, part now, please. We're going to be hearing from the Jewish Museum in Minsk. Uh, hello, dear friends, dear colleagues. My name is uh, Alexander Nelubov. I'm the director of Jewish Museum in Minsk. Uh, so just uh, uh, what, to do, uh, what do we mean when we speak about Holocaust in Belarus? Um, what, is, what is Holocaust? The murder of more than 60% of the Jewish population of Europe by the Nazis and their collaborators during the Second World War has received the name Holocaust in modern history. The Holocaust is also sometimes uh, called Shoah. Uh, in Hebrew, it means, uh, uh, it means catastroph catastrophe. On the eve of the Great Patriotic War, about one million Jews lived on the territory of Belarus within its modern borders. The German Nazis invasion of the Soviet Union had the most tragic consequences for the Jewish population of Belarus. Here, in the very center of Europe, the Nazis and their collaborators killed, tortured, burned, buried alive over 800,000 Jews, whose only fault was that they were born from Jewish parents and uh, uh, Belarus became the first republic of uh, the former Soviet Union to be attacked by the German military machine. Belarusian Jews were the first victims of the policy of total extermination, and uh, it was here that the Nazis first tested the machine, ma machine of mass murder, an important measure of the occup occupiers to isolate uh, the Jews from the other groups of uh, population in uh, Belarus. And uh, in the beginning of uh, July, uh, the German Nazi administration did the uh, order uh, that all Jews had to uh, leave their homes. Because, uh, you know, um, in uh, other European uh, towns, Jews lived more or less uh, locally, but uh, so as uh, Minsk was on the Soviet territories, Jews lived uh, everywhere in the city and they had to gather together in one place which was called uh, Geta. So in Minsk, it happened in the beginning of July. And as well, there was an order that all Jews had to wear ad ad identification marks. This was um, a yellow, yellow sign, uh, more than 10 centimeters in diameter. Uh, and uh, all uh, Jewish men, women, elderly people, and children older than ten years, ten years, they had to wear this special, special sign. Uh, all in all, on the Belarusian ter territory, we have information about more than 300, uh, 360 ghettos and places of mass, uh, mass confinement of the Jewish population, uh, which were created. Uh, during 1941. Most of the getters, over 200 existed in the eastern part of the Republic, and more than 100 were created in the western part. Living conditions in all the getters were unbearable. Every morning the gates were opened and hundreds, thousands of people were sent in columns under escort for forced labor. Yeah, we have to mention that uh, uh, when Nazis occupied uh, every single town uh, in Belarus, they uh, 
they had to check who is Jewish, who, who is not Jewish, with the help of neighbors, with the help of uh, documents. Sometimes they did it uh, just uh, visually. If somebody looked like a Jew, they made uh, the, the, these people to go to the ghetto. And uh, as well, they did a se selection. They tried to find, uh, you, you can say, use, useful people who had a profession, who were craftsmen, uh, like cobblers, tailors, or people who had any other profession. And uh, uh, today, when we speak about uh, education, and when we speak with children, we try to tell different stories. And we have a story of uh, uh, Mikhail Treister. Uh, when uh, the Nazis came to, to Minsk city, he was only 14, 14. He was a teenager and uh, for sure he didn't have any profession yet. But when Nazis started selection, he said that he is a, he is a cobbler, uh, a sandler. So uh, thanks to, uh, to, to this, he, he got an opportunity to survive. And uh, when uh, he joined this uh, forced labor uh, columns, uh, he came to the craft shops and his, uh, his neighbors, his Jewish neighbors, his friends, they uh, gave him an idea how to make shoes, how to repair shoes. And fortunately, he survived and uh, his, he joined the underground movement and partisan brigade. And later, he saved his mother and his uh, sister and many other uh, Jews from, from Vietnam. So um, these uh, Jews who were used uh, in forced labor, they were sent to do the dirtiest, hardest, often impossible jobs like dismantling destroyed buildings, cleaning railway tracks, uh, digging holes, trenches, cleaning the city, cleaning toilets, and others. A contribution was collected from the prisoners as well, uh, from the prisoners of the ghetto. They were obliged to hand over all the gold, silver, and other valuable things they had. Uh, Nazis ordered uh, uh, forbade Jews from changing their place of residence without the permission of the German authorities. Uh, Jews were not allowed to use sidewalks, visiting public places like schools, cinemas, libraries, theaters. They uh, couldn't get marriage and perform kosher slaughter of cattle or any other. Uh, they couldn't follow any other Jewish traditions. Uh, and as well, Jewish residents of uh, cities and towns, they didn't have right to trade. Uh, that's why it was very difficult for them uh, to have an opportunity to get any food, uh, sometimes to get water, to get any warm clothes. Uh, their conditions were really terrible. And uh, when people uh, who survived the, the Jewish ghetto, when they speak about uh, the conditions, they say that uh, they lived much harder uh, than uh, people in the country, concentration camp uh, because in con concentration camp, people had a schedule, they had a kind of work as well. They got uh, very poor, but they, they got food. In, in getters, everything was uh, forbidden. People couldn't get very, very simple things. And uh, the only penalty when they broke rules, uh, the only penalty was death. Um, the realization of the Nazi policy of genocide began from the very first days of war, and its first victims were Jews, as well as communists and Soviet activists. During July, August 1941, in Brest, uh, four to 5,000 Jews were shot. Uh, in Baranovici, about 400. In Slonim, 1,075 people. In Lida, more than 4,000. In Pinsk, 4,500. 
and uh, uh, already during the first months of the war, uh, hundreds and thousands of Jews were killed. Um, just a uh, few facts about the Minsk ghetto. Uh, we must say that the Minsk ghetto was among the largest in Europe, in addition to the Jews of Minsk. Jews from nearby cities and towns were concentrated in the ghetto, as well as mixed families in which one of the uh, sources was Jewish. Living conditions in the ghetto were unbearable and from uh, yes, so um, every day, every month, life in the ghetto became more and more, uh, more and more hard. And the Nazis not only exterminated people, but also uh, uh, they took them th uh, through fear, mockery, hunger to stop any thought of resistance from those who were still alive. And uh, in Minsk, we know uh, four great pogroms, uh, four uh, great uh, big executions, uh, but uh, the people who survived, they usually said that uh, their life in Geta, it was like one long pogrom, one long execution every, every single day. By the way, um, we still have some uh, some people who survived alive, uh, they were, uh, when the war started, uh, they were at the age of six, uh, six, eight years old. Today, uh, people who were only six, uh, children, today they are 88 years old. They are really old people. Uh, it's a miracle that they are still alive and we can get some information and they can remind something and tell it to us. Uh, one of the most uh, heartbreaking story is a story of 26 prisoners of uh, the Minsk ghetto who have, uh, they, they voluntarily uh, confirmed themselves in the basement uh, they were short of food and water and waited for the Red Army to arrive. They spent the terrible 263 days and nights, and nights in this underground shelter. 13 of them survived. Um, it's, really, it's really hard to imagine how, how did they, uh, how it was possible. Uh, as well, when we speak about Holocaust, it's very important to say that uh, uh, um, nearly uh, in, in average, when we speak about Europe, in average, only nearly 2% of prisoners of ghettos survived. In Minsk, the uh, percentage was a little bit uh, bigger because close to Minsk there were uh, Jewish partisan brigades. In Minsk ghetto there was an uh, underground movement and uh, nearly 10% of uh, Jews who were in Minsk ghetto uh, survived. Uh, so as well, there were people, uh, Belarusians, Russians, Poles all over the country who survived Jews. Uh, today, uh, we call them writers, people among the nations. Uh, it's really impossible to imagine their heroic deed. Uh, they, uh, uh, they, their life was in risk. Their families, their children, their neighbors. Um, so when Nazis uh, discovered that somebody helped Jewish people or uh, gave them a shelter, they executed the family. So to the, it, it's really hard to imagine how they uh, how it, they dare to, to do this. But all in all, today in Belarus, we have, we know about uh, more than 800 writers people among the nations. Uh, so in general, J Belarusian people who uh, gave any help or saved uh, Jewish lives. 
So this is uh, what I wanted uh, to to tell to tell you just in fifteen minutes. So you're welcome if you have any questions. Yeah. Yes. yes. Uh, we have a couple of questions on our end. Uh, one of my students wanted to know exactly how this has impressed the uh, psyche or the uh, of the uh, surviving Jewish people in Minsk area in Belarus. Oh, pardon, Michael. Can you can you repeat, please? Yeah, how has this impacted the population of the Jewish people that remained afterwards? And how has this impacted the people of Belarus uh, from what they experienced from 41 to 44, even today? Uh, you see, um, actually, uh, not so many Jewish people survived during the, during the Holocaust in Belarus. Uh, when we speak about numbers, before the Second World War, a Jewish population in Belarus was nearly one million people, uh, and only uh, nearly eight hundred thousand people were killed. Uh, so mostly people uh, who survived. Uh, very few people from uh, ghettos survived, as well uh, survived people who joined the Red Army, uh, as well uh, people who had an opportunity to leave uh, the territory of Belarus before Nazis came to the towns. Um, but after the war, uh, Jews from all over the Soviet, uh, Soviet Union came to Belarus. But, uh, uh, you, you know, before the Second World War, Jewish population, it was like nearly 10% of uh, Belarusian population, if we speak in general, uh, if we speak about several towns and cities, uh, in Minsk, uh, it was uh, 52%, in Babrusk, more than 70 So, uh, But today, Jewish population is like 0.5%. So the Holocaust influenced uh, very much uh, to the uh, to, to, to the Jewish culture uh, in Belarus, we, we can say like this. In the future, what role do you see the uh, museum playing in, in for uh, potential help in education in Belarus? So I think you know it's very important to tell uh, to tell our children about uh, what 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 can happen. Uh, it uh, for for us today it's very difficult to believe in in uh, that information we get from uh, different sources about Holocaust, what we hear from the people who survived, and uh, our museum. Uh, we try to tell people about Holocaust, but as well, we see that it's very important to tell people about Jewish culture, because, uh, you know, uh, it's uh, interesting that uh, sometimes when children, school children come to the museum with their teachers, and I ask them a question, do, uh, do you have a Jewish friend or a Jewish classmate or neighbor? Have you ever seen a Jew alive? Most, usually people, the children say no, no, they they don't know who who are Jews. What is our culture? What is our, what what are our traditions? So we have to tell children first of all about Jewish culture, about Jewish traditions, about Jewish history, and after that, uh, they can, uh, you know, they can think, they can know about Holocaust, and they can understand that uh, Jews are the, the same people with a very ancient culture and uh, after that they, they can uh, they, they you know they can think about holocaust and uh, do their own decision yeah one interesting fact i found by uh, preparing for this 
was that uh, Raphael Lemkin was born in Belarus or would become Belarus in 1900. And um, he died, I think, when he's 58 years old in, in New York. But the interesting part about that was because you always mention him as being Polish or you mentioned him. He went to his uh, uh, grad, uh, I guess, university in, 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 in it became the Ukraine. So, you know, there have been some very famous uh, Russian or I mean, Belarusian uh, Jewish people. And then today on the 75th anniversary celebration, one of the gentlemen that was uh, very uh, pivotal in getting the UN to actually sponsor that was actually was born in Belarus, would become Belarus. So the, there's a lot of things that history can teach us. And there's a lot of things that we are being neglected to have been told in the, in the future. So I really do appreciate your hard work in this effort. And now we're going to go to uh, my good friend in uh, South America, uh, Enrique. He's going to give us, uh, uh, I believe, uh, some information. Enrique? Uh Thanks, Mike, for your invitation. Uh, received the warmest greeting from the oldest new world, Peru, to your great guests. Um, we congratulate the effort that you make in order to create awareness about the tragic uh, results that Holocaust and genocides have created. Um, global consciousness. Uh, we appreciate a lot the your great uh, guests can recall and highlight that we cannot forget what has been happening and still is happening nowadays. We live in South America. We have uh, excellent partners in Lebanon, Bolivia, uh, Nigeria, their students are uh, now with us because we are not isolated from the effect that these uh, holocausts and genocides have created in global consciousness. And we appreciate a lot that by your outstanding job, um, Mike, we can spread the seeds of love because we need to accept each other in the difference that we can uh, show because it makes us uh, richer and at the same time we create a global citizenship with our students who are now in Nigeria. This is a wonderful, wonderful experience for all of us who are not an active uh, part of all this uh, tragedy, because I know that you are descendants from people from Belarus and Armenia. Um, now, there are other countries that are facing the same situation, this um, ethnical uh, extermination by political issues, cultural differences, but my main goal is to congratulate all and each one of you for creating this great uh, awareness. So if we forget the story, it's highly probable that it will be repeated in another occasion. And thanks, Mike, for your wonderful references. And I appreciate a lot the effort that your friends, teachers, and colleagues are making in order to promote a better uh, option for all of us to live without the kind of tragedies like uh, Holocaust and genocides. We appreciate a lot your effort. Um, we'll we go ahead. Want... Uh, thank you very much, Enrique. I'm sorry. 
if you could go ahead and start with your presentation from the Belarusian Geographic Society. Um, good morning. Can you actually hear me? Oh, good. Great. Um, well, my name is Alex. I'm just going to share the presentation right now. Um, just a second. Right, so can you hear it? Uh, can you hear me? Can you see it? Yes, we can see it. Right, great. Um, so, hello everyone, my name is Alex. I'll be uh, representing one of the projects done by uh, the Belarusian Geographical Society. Um, the name of the project is Walking Across Belarus. Um, there's a nice John Locke quote here. I'm not really sure if it's an actual quote by John Locke, but that's what it is. Um, the project is pretty relevant because as many uh, of our colleagues have already said, um, Belarus was one of the most, if not the most, devastated country when war had ended. And it was actually the only one um, you know, that didn't really come to the pre-war population after the baby boom, which happened after, immediately after the Second World War, by uh, 1968. So you can imagine the amount of devastation and loss of human lives that entailed the, the battlefields for one of the <clears throat> most destructive wars in the human history. Um, but the project itself is actually deeply rooted in the idea of uh, cadastral maps, which is not particularly exciting, but a uh, cadastral map is generally used for, you know, land users, land owners, um, other parties interested in, you know, understanding more about um, essentially which land belongs to whom. And um, on the map itself, on the Belarusian version of the map, which you can think of as a basically um, Google Maps for Belarusian ones, etc. Uh, there is a, a layer that deals with this exact kind of information about different monuments, different memorials dedicated to uh, the Great Patriotic War, um, the Second World War, and also the atrocities or the you know feats of heroism that happened during that time. Um, so, yeah, this layer right now is mostly filled with uh, the more known monuments. And most of those monuments are located in easily accessible places, so just outside of major cities or, you know, um, big dedicated memorials like uh, you know, Hutting Village, for example. Uh, but a lot of them are actually, you know, located in far off lands, you know, in the middle of the woods. Um, so basically in the middle of nowhere, so to speak. And in this picture, you can see that one of the monuments, one of such monuments that was uh, dedicated to um, the family of the heroes of the Union, Kijavato, uh, is actually located in a completely wrong place. Uh, so one of the ideas behind the project was to actually um, give people motivation to do two great things. One of them is hiking. So basically, you know, um, spending more time outdoors um trekking um cycling trips and the other one was to uh make sure that the cadastral map and the location and information about the monuments and memorials is um up to date and accurate um and so in 2022 uh, the breast assets of the belarusian geographical society uh, started implementing the project um in Maluita district, which is one of the districts of the wider Brest region, uh, 64 monuments from around the time of the war were marked uh, and you know updated on the public cadastral map. And during those hikes, during those you know uh, during the campaign, so to speak, to uh, drive more awareness about the the whole topic, uh, five historical routes were uh, actually you know presented and created. For people who would like to not just you know hike through some picturesque um, routes, <laughs> sorry for that, but uh, you know to actually learn a little bit more about what was happening at the time. And uh, a bit of a you know trivia is uh, during the uh, you know mapping out of the routes, the participants actually discovered remains of uh, a 
students of a young soldier from uh, the musician platoon of one of the regiments of the Soviet army who dies during, uh, you know, the initial retreat in June of 1941 uh, during the evacuation. Um, and the project turned out to be quite popular with different kind of people because, again, it's not just, you know, to do with history, but it's also uh, to be very hands-on with history as it's literally in the field uh, with people going to, you know, slightly less known places and um, learning more about their history and learning more about what they, um, you know, what happened to families like theirs that lived uh, 75 years ago. Um, so it's gradually becoming uh, more and more attractive to different people. Uh, lots of school children partake in these kind of hikes uh, and, you know, all kinds of people, again, not just uh, tourist companies, but also um, teachers, um, enthusiasts, history enthusiasts, um, you know, try to help out with uh, creating hiking routes, um, you know, teaching the children how to do topography, orienting yourselves on the land, um, basic survival strategies, um, etc. Um, so yeah, that's more or less it. And here you can see some of the pictures that were taken during the uh, the drive. And I think here, yeah, we have uh, another thing that was quite a significant um, revelation made by some of the people who were partaking in the hiking uh, activities as they found uh, the remains of two families who were living on a farmstead, uh, homestead, and were executed by the Nazi invaders um, in the spring of 2023. Uh, another interesting thing uh, it happened in November 2023. Uh, it was a hike made during, you know, heavy snowfall time, uh, dedicated to the Panathilos 28, which was a team of men uh, who were during the Nazi assault on Moscow, um, engaged in heavy fighting with the German soldiers to try and stave off the initial assault and give more time to the people to evacuate. Um, some new ideas have come up uh, during, you know, the hikes and stuff. So like uh, the Woodland Cinema, which you can see there in the picture, which is essentially when you have a hike and a little camping trip and you also, well, uh, do a little bit of uh, cinema to show films, movies about the war, uh, like Go and See, which is a pretty uh, famous film, I think, about the war um, and others. Uh, and there's also some new developments for the project, um, things that people uh, would like to implement in the future uh, to do more about the trekking, um, you know, and search and rescue movement in the Republic of Belarus. And uh, it's also a project that might be a very important milestone in developing new permanent routes for historical tourism that is quite uh, popular here in Belarus. And uh, that's basically it. So if you have any questions, I'll be more than happy to uh, answer the phone. Thank you, Alexander. Uh, Alexander is my colleague. I present the Belarusian Geographic Society. And uh, uh, we continue to, uh, to tell you about our project uh, 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 now Belarus, and uh, uh, if you in uh, any proposal or any question, please uh, feel free to contact us. Thank you. Yeah, uh, thank you so much, uh, Pavo. Uh, we have those. Um, awards that the Geographic Society had given us earlier, would, would this be appropriate time to display those or do you want to go ahead and give your comments now? Pablo? Uh, 
Abel, you you were muted, so we couldn't hear you. Okay, I'm sorry. Yeah, uh, excuse me. This is uh, we have the uh, awards from June that were given out that uh, we could give the Ge uh, Geographic Society. Some a lot of the people are here uh, to do that. I could display that now before Pablo gives his uh, remarks. Would that be okay? Okay. Uh, ben, you may want to do the first one here. Yes, we're very honored to award Mr. Pavel Shedlovsky with this honorary degree for your commitment to the cause of genocide awareness. Pavel, it's been a, a pleasure working with you throughout these many years and, and thank you again for your support of this important program which teaches so many young people here in Texas and throughout America about the situation that occurred in Belarus. Okay, and all this will be given to you guys in, in the after program that we have, and we have some other special materials included. So the next one, um, if you could go ahead, someone from the Geographic so Geographical Society could read off the person's name, please. Okay, this one, I'll just read it, I guess. This one is from the Belarusian Geographical Society. It's for Ben Ramirez. Uh, Executive Director of the World Affairs Council of Austin. He's being honored with honorary geographic education. Uh, this is the uh, mayor of San Marcos. Uh, she was with us in June and uh, Jane Houston, and she is getting a her honorary doctoral degree in geographic education from Belarusian Geographical Society. Uh, this is uh, myself, Michael Cunningham, uh, getting an honorary doctoral degree in geographic education. I would like to mention I do have two degrees in geography, so this is something that I've had an academic interest in for many years, uh, mostly in uh, migration patterns. So uh, th th this was very, uh, very, very nice. We have the, our mayor of Austin, the, the 10th largest city in the United States, Kurt Watson. Uh, he was at a mean day, but he's uh, expressed his desire and he actually has a little video here that we're gonna show. Hi, I'm Kirk Watson, mayor of Austin, Texas. Studying history is important. It's important because it teaches us about ourselves but it also helps us understand mistakes of the past as we try to carve a positive Hopefully you can hear that. You're doing very important work teaching about the, the horrors of genocide. I want to thank you for making sure that we don't repeat the mistakes of the past and that we're better people. It's a, a very nice tribute to a, a very busy mayor who uh, took out some time to actually do that. So we appreciate that so much. It's important because it teaches us about ourselves, but it also helps us understand mistakes of the past as we try to carve. We have just a few more. Sorry. You're doing very important work teaching about the, the horrors of genocide. I want to thank you for making sure that we don't repeat the mistakes of the past and that we're better people going forward. Okay, well, let's try to find this out real quick. Well, we're, we're gonna win this there we go. Here we have Vanessa Fuentes. Uh, Vanessa is our councilwoman for the city of Austin in district number two. Here we have Kate Means. Uh, Kate Means is a uh, uh, a AGBU AVC intern and also an intern for World Affairs Council. Kate, could you come over here and thank him, please? Oh, 
Hi, um, I want to thank you very much for this degree and the significance it holds for secondary students who learn about genocide. Um, I'm honored to be a part, um, this, to be included in this meeting and all the information that's been spread. Thank you. Next, we have Lillian Kibler. She's a AGBU ABC intern and World Affairs Council intern. So I just want to thank y'all for the award. And I also want to thank you for the opportunity to be a part of the project and to gain all the knowledge that I did by being a part of it. It really means a lot to me. So thank you. Okay, now we'll hear from Pablo. Pablo, excuse me. And if he could go ahead with his remarks. Yes, uh, thank you. I'm, I'm ready. Do you hear me now? Yes, I'll stop the screen sharing. Okay, I'm ready. Uh, do you hear me well? Yes. Uh, I would like, first of all, to thank uh, Mike Cunningham, my friend and director of the Geography of uh, Genocide Project, for this uh, important and timely conference and for inviting me to speak. I also thank Ben Ramirez uh, of the World Affairs Council, Austin, for uh, the award that he has bestowed on me. I, I, I really appreciate that. I wholly agree uh, with Mike that Holocaust genocide is a chapter not to be erased. And I agree with Ibrahim, who spoke earlier, that history helps shape a better future. I also agree with Lillian that justice will always prevail. I will uh, speak uh, on the topic of uh, what it means to be a Belarusian 1941-1944 and now. Actually, the Belarusian Geographical Society project is a good example of a connection between the past and the present. Uh, I will start with a personal story. My dad, Adam, was born in 1924. He would have turned uh, 100 next year. He was a partisan during the war. And I had the privilege of hearing firsthand about courage and resilience that the undefeated Belarusian people demonstrated during the Great Patriotic War. The war which we waged against the Nazis, protecting our statehood, our families, our right to live. Thanks to my dad, I feel very strongly the connection of the generations. Uh, I came to realize that historically 80 years is a blink of an eye. I have many times visited his native village of Tashki, 40 miles to the north of Minsk. The village has remained very much the same over the years. And I dare to say so have the people of Belarus. In 2021, just like 80 years ago, we Belarusians stood up against outside attempts to chip away at our sovereignty and at the things we normally take for granted, like prosperity, security, peace, life. The difference between now and then is that the war waged against, against our people now is not fought, that the people are not dying and the property is not destroyed, but nevertheless, the war is no less dangerous. It is a hybrid war, invisible waged in information and cyber spaces. It is aimed against our people, especially younger generation. To withstand it, we need courage, uh, unity, resilience, viable national idea, and a strong government for the people. And we need to preserve historical truth. Specifically, the truth about the crimes of genocide against the Belarusian people committed by the Nazis and their henchmen from uh, some of the neighboring states during 1941-1944 and after the war. People, not only in Belarus, but all over the world, have the right to know the truth about what happened in Belarus during the Nazi occupation. Crimes of uh, those war years must never be forgotten and must never be repeated. 
we came to understand that the genocide of the Belarusian people during the Great Patriotic War must be given a systemic legal assessment. There must be no statute of limitations on crimes of genocide, crimes against humanity. Perpetrators of these crimes must be prosecuted to the fullest extent of the law, no matter if they are alive or dead. Defeating Wehrmacht and persecuting Nazi criminals was not enough. Nazism is again raising its ugly head. Some countries are openly supporting Nazi ideology. Some are attempting to apply collective responsibility on entire peoples and nations. The recent standing ovation for a Nazi criminal in the Canadian parliament is a telling example how far it can go. And another good example out of concern for spread of uh, anti-Semitism and radicalism in Australia, the Prosecutor General of Australia ruled that Nazi salute is a criminal act according to the federal law of Australia. In this effort, in this context, I appreciate the efforts of Mike Cunningham aimed to raise public awareness in the US and abroad about the inhuman nature and long lasting consequences of genocide in the framework of his unique geography of a genocide project. I also applaud, applaud Mike's decision to include the discussion of genocide uh, of the Belarusian people in his project. We in Belarus support this project and we try to lead by example. In April, 2021, according to the law, our prosecutor general's office initiated a criminal case into the genocide of the civilian people living in Belarus during the Great Patriotic War. The Institute of History of Academy of Sciences assumed the role of a focal point for research of the historical data concerning genocide of the Belarusian people. Analysts, educators, scientists, local authorities from all over the country are actively involved. I am pleased to announce here that the Office of the Prosecutor General of Belarus has invited Mike to participate and deliver address at the international conference to be held in Minsk on December 7th, just uh, three days from now, dedicated to the 75th anniversary of the adoption of the UN Convention on the Prevention and Punishment of the Crime of Genocide. Belarusians were subjected to all forms of genocide as defined in the Convention. I'm also pleased to inform you that Mike, just a week ago, had a chance to speak for the record with Prosecutor Valeria Talkachov, leading interagency investigating group charged with investigating the crimes of genocide against the people of Belarus. Prosecutor Talkachov answered a number of questions about his work and shared his personal experience as well. Also, Prosecutor Talkachov will share with Mike the three books that his office has published on genocide of the Belarusian people, on death camps, and the brand new, just published on punitive operations of the Nazis and enablers. I'll be honored to pass these books to Mike once I get a hold of them. These books are part of our systemic effort aimed to raise public awareness about the new evidence obtained during the investigation. Book one, the book on genocide has some history. Long before the war, the Nazi Germany had worked out plans to commit genocide against the Belarusian people. These plans were part of German legislation. General Plan Ost of March 1941, order on military jurisdiction in the area of Barbarossa of May 1941, made atrocities against civilians as part of state policy of the Reich and provided for the acquittal of soldiers of the crimes committed. According to the Nazi, convent, Nazi documents, the, his, the territory of Belarus was subject to settlement by the Germans and incorporation into Nazi Germany. Population of Belarus and other occupied territories should have been totally killed. Some residents, including the Belarusians, between 10 and 15% should have been turned into slaves. They were supposed to be killed anyway, but later. 
Book two, the book on death camps, preliminary results of the investigation of the criminal case give grounds to assert that on the territory of uh, Belarus, unlike in the occupied countries of uh, Western Europe, in all types of death camps, the Nazis were implementing the main goal of the genocide, the total physical destruction of Slavic, Jewish, and other populations. On the Belarusian territory, Nazi criminals and their accomplices created various types of death camps, including concentration camps, forced labor camps, ghettos, prisons, camps on the front line of the German defense, worker camps, work columns, children's death camps, and others. Functioning of death camps on the territory of Belarus was not widely studied by scientists, was not publicized. Now, this topic acquired particular significance due to the need to prevent falsification of history, distortion of the actual events. Book three, the book on punitive operations shows previously unknown to the general public materials about planning and implementing by the Nazi Germany of the policy of genocide on the territory of the Belarusian Soviet Socialist Republic by means of mass punitive operations. The book shows that the war of extermination, including unpre unprecedented in its severity forms and methods of extermination of our people, was planned by the Nazis long before the actual military invasion of the Soviet Union territory. The book presents evidence showing that from the first days of the war, the Nazis not only used forms of mass extermination of our citizens, but also thought out the most effective and efficient among them. There is also evidence of the participation of collaborators in Nazi crimes and punitive operations. The book describes specific examples of Nazi training of punishers from among Belarusian nationalists, who after training in special intelligence and sabotage schools, served in the interests of the realization of the Nazi policy of genocide. Presenting the latest book, the Prosecutor General's Office's spokesperson said that during the Great Patriotic War, the Nazis carried out in Belarus at least 187 punitive operations. Before the investigation of the criminal case of genocide, it was known about 140 such operations carried out by the occupants on our territory. Today, we have the opportunity to assert that the Nazi criminals carried out at least 187. The latest data and documents prove that the Nazis and their accomplices not only hanged, burned, and shot our people, but also dropped poisonous substances on them from airplanes. Nazis were resourceful in exertions to establish through their experiments the most effective ways of exterminating our population. Forcible deportation of the Belarusian people to Germany and other countries of Western Europe for slave labor was carried out to the fullest extent. The Nazi occupants reached heights of cynicism, in inventing names for their punitive operation like Winter Magic, Spring Festival, rabbit hunt to conceal their true goals. A couple of days ago, Prosecutor General of Belarus, Andrei Shved, stated that in 2021, during the investigation of the criminal case on genocide, a principled decision was made to declassify almost all criminal cases considered in the post-war period by courts and related to Nazi criminals and their accomplices. Today, more than 42,000 archived cases that were not previously available to the public were made public. The cumulative analysis of the specified criminal cases once again shows, allows us to draw a conclusion about the true plans and objectives of the Third Reich to destroy the civilian population of the Belarusian Belarus Soviet Socialist Republic. Nationalist units from almost all of Western Europe took part in punitive operations. 
almost all of modern NATO was here. That's what was said by Andrei Shved. He also drew attention to the unmotivated cruelty of the invaders and devaluation of human life. His office will continue to strive to bring to criminal responsibility every living Nazi criminal, despite the fact that these people enjoy the protection of foreign states and are hiding in their territories. It is important to form an impartial picture of the genocide and show the true role of the punishers through the decisions of the national courts. It is necessary to reveal the role of every one of them in punitive operations. Why investigate now after 80 years elapsed? Because the memory of that war for all of us is sacred. Every family has people, ancestors, who either fought or died or were killed by the Nazis during the occupation. The subject is painful for us because witnesses in these horrible events are still alive. Because we see attempts of the today's offsprings of the Nazis to rewrite the history, to distort the great victory, to turn thugs and end killers into the righteous. For the number of reasons we kept silent in the Soviet times and after getting independence, about a number of reasons. It was politically incorrect. Many collaborators, enablers of the Nazis, were from the former Soviet republics, so we chose not to agitate ethnic hatred. For over the last, but, but over the last years, they were not thinking of how to instill rejection of Nazis into the children, but how to breed neo-Nazis. A second Drangnach Osten march toward the east is being prepared or even started in 2020 during mass protests. It was neo-Nazis who formed the nucleus of the strike force aimed to take over state power in Belarus. It was against the background of domestic events that we understood that we overlooked, that we lost something in the education of the youth in ideological work. And we came to understand that someone was trying to rewrite our history for us. So it became important to prevent the penetration of the neo-Nazi ideology in, into Belarus. One of the proposals for the president was to initiate a criminal case into the genocide of the Belarusian people. It is incumbent upon us to tell our people the truth, fully and straightforward. People must see what Nazism really is. I will give you uh, some recent uh, statistics uh, of the investigation to bring you up to speed. More than 17,100 victims and witnesses have been interviewed during investigation of the criminal case of genocide since its inception. 483 inspections of areas where the civilian population was supposed to be exterminated and buried were carried out. 39 excavations were carried out and local search work is underway. 586 places of forced detention of the population have been identified on the territory of Belarus, including 90 previously unknown. At least 11,726 completely or partially burned settlements have been identified, including 2,526 previously unknown. At least 270 settlements shared the fate of Hatin. That is, they were completely destroyed along with their inhabitants and were not revived after the war. 141 requests for legal assistance in the criminal case of genocide have been prepared. Requests were sent to 28 foreign countries. The investigation is a nationwide project. All our prosecutors are involved in it. During the occupation, an entire Belarus was turned into one gigantic brotherhood grave. There is no district in Belarus where there are no graves, where mass killings did not occur. Burial sites were discovered following the testimonies of living witnesses, their relatives, and study of National Archives of Belarus, of the KGB and Interior Ministry, and of other countries, primarily Russia. 
prosecutors locate the place, do the excavations, remove the remains, conduct expertise and organize events to commemorate the memory of the deceased. Educational and ideological work is then carried out with local school children visiting such places. The work on a burial site is not finalized until everything is discovered, documented, documented, analyzed, and immortalized. Over 3 million citizens, Soviet citizens, were killed on our territory, including Belarusian nationals, prisoners of war, and other persons who fled from the occupied territories. Every third person who lived in a war Belarus died. The criminal case of genocide of the Belarusian people during the Great Patriotic War and the post-war period continues to be investigated. There will be no more genocide against the Belarusian people. Thank you for your attention. I'm ready to take your questions. Thank you very much, Pavel. Uh, if there's no questions or anything, let's go ahead and go with um, uh, Ben. Ben has some concluding remarks, and then we may have a special song from, uh, uh, depending on how long Ben talks, we have a special song from South America they prepared for us. Thank you very much, Pavel. I really appreciate your remarks. And, you know, unfortunately, coming through the American education system, uh, we do not look at these types of situations. Uh, being a young country, uh, America uh, and our education system likes to focus on the American experience. And, you know, we only briefly touch upon what happened during the Second World War, as well as in other examples of genocide that happened around the world. So that's why this program has been so important for us to initiate here uh, with Del Valley High School and with the partners that Del Valley has throughout the US and around the world. One of the consequences of the American-focused education programs that we see are we end up electing leaders who don't understand what really happens and get confused and speak about Nazis and apply the word Nazi to people that they just have as their political opponents. And that devalues the actual word as well as the impact that real Nazis had on humanity. And so when real neo-Nazis appear, Americans don't have any idea as to, you know, what, what that impact will have on the human race. So we really appreciate Alexitos Yori and your uh, colleague, uh, Alex, as well as Pavel for spending so much time with us today to help students and those here in America understand the impact of the Belarus genocide. And I really do appreciate Mike Cunningham for assembling us here today. Uh, thank you all. And I look forward to hearing an uplifting song uh, because this uh, discussion, you know, it, it's uh, deeply impactful. And thank you again, Mike, for, for this opportunity. We're going to play a song here if it works out right. I know this isn't the song, though. Enrique, do you have the song? I have sent you the link in your inbox. Okay, go ahead. Uh, but, uh, I will. Wait, wait, wait. I will send you the song with the uh, Belarus uh, flag. Okay. Okay, give me a second. Sir. Yes. They have some the students from Africa singing this uh, song give about. Me a second. Uh, give me a second. Give me a second. Give me a second. Okay. 
In the meantime, I would like to share the the gratitude that I have for all, all of you that participate today and for the people that participated and uh, put in some stuff for our book that we're developing on this area. Uh, this is uh, something that I was uh, put on one of the highlights and I shared with Pablo earlier. My grandfather, uh, the person I was named after, great-grandfather, was a um, pretty famous, he was state senator from Idaho and he was also an owner of a newspaper. And at the end of his life, he was a, a course, foreign correspondent in Washington, DC. And that happened to be where I was born. But the, uh, the thing that was significant about it is when you get to, to actually live history, and you could feel the intensity of uh, being able to talk, uh, I, I believe, on the 27th of last month uh, with uh, the prosecutor and and how he really felt about the, these things. And he's telling, sharing with us some of the stories about some of his relatives that were died and uh, in that war. And I shared the fact that my grandfather ended up dying in 1944 as well. So uh, we have a lot of commonalities. Just a moment, I'm muting it for a second while we get going. Yeah, we, we're going to have announcements for a bit, so this might be an opportune time to say thank you so much from our end, and we really appreciate it. And for people continuing, we'll have another conference that begins at 10 o'clock. Uh, for the people who are not continuing, I sure appreciate it. Thank you so much, and have a great evening in Belarus, and a great evening wherever you're at. Thank you.